good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Tamika, for the introduction as well. Um, it's worth going back. I'm looking more at the BVI's own application of um, arbitral uh, awards and its enforcement of them over the years. To so that, to so those words at the beginning, the question: uh, the court shall not interfere in the arbitration of a dispute. This is a powerful statement of intent. It is, to say the least, extremely unusual to see a statutory provision refer to the court as potentially interfering. The word has clearly been deliberately chosen to add extra emphasis to the restriction which that section places on the court's ability to intervene in an arbitration. Even where the statute does permit the court to interfere, it is at pains to limit the interference to the express provisions of the Act and to require it to give due regard to the wishes of the parties and the provisions of the arbitration agreement. There was clearly a great concern in the draftsman's mind that the court's usual powers, including those of statutory interpretation, be kept on a very tight leash indeed. It does therefore seem that the Act has been drafted, as Geoffrey was saying, to restrain the court as a potential competitor from interfering in arbitrations. In fact, though, an analysis of BVI commercial division cases doesn't really provide any grounds for accusing the court here of actually acting like a competitor. It's not hard to find cases under the old Act where the BVI court has gone out of its way to promote arbitration and to emphasize the freedom of parties to contract to resolve their disputes however they see fit. In the case of Zanotti and Interlock Finance, the commercial division judge had to consider whether an arbitration agreement could apply so that a claim for unfair prejudice relief against a BVI company would have to be stayed. The then current English authority, Exeter City Football Club Limited, said that a contractual agreement could not oust the statutory right of a member of a company to apply for minority shareholder relief. In his judgment, Mr. Justice Bannister had seemingly little hesitation in finding that the Exeter City case was not good law and should not be followed, seemingly by anyone here or abroad. He said, I can see nothing contrary to public policy in shareholders agreeing to resolve internal disputes by way of arbitration. On the contrary, public policy encourages arbitration. Ultimately, the English forces came to agree when the Exeter City case was overturned in the case of Fulham Football Club. One of the main areas where the jurisprudence prevents arbitration clauses from overriding statutory rights is in relation to liquidations. Even there, however, the BVI court has done what it can to maintain the freedom of parties to agree between themselves how their disputes should be resolved. In Artemis Trustees Limited, the BVI Court considered whether to stay an application to wind up and dissolve two partnerships on the basis of an arbitration clause. It was argued against the stay that there was no dispute arising out of or connected with the partnership articles such that the arbitration clause should be engaged. It was said that the object of the exercise was not to resolve issues in connection with the articles, but to put an end to the party's relationship by way of an order of the court. Again, the BVI court was referred to a UK authority in the matter of wine inns, this time from the Court of Appeal of Northern Ireland. Again, Mr Justice Bannister declined to follow it, and again he criticised the approach taken by that court in explicit terms. The Northern Irish case involved a member of a company petitioning for a just and equitable winding up. The Northern Ireland Court of Appeal held that there were two issues between the parties. One, whether it was just and equitable that the company be wound up, and two, whether the company's affairs had been conducted in such a way that the petitioner was entitled to relief. It held that neither of those issues came within the scope of the arbitration provision because neither of them constituted a doubt, difference or dispute affecting the shareholder's agreement or the construction of any of its terms. Nor did the issues concern the business of the company or affect rights of any shareholder under the agreement which did not explicitly purport to govern the situation where a winding up remedy was being sought. Finally, the court held that it could not suppose that the parties could have intended to refer to arbitration, a matter in respect of which the arbitrator would have no power to grant any relief sought in the proceedings. Mr Justice Bannister's view was that the Court of Appeal in Northern Ireland had taken an impermissible approach to the construction of the arbitration clause. He said that the question whether or not particular relief should be awarded by an arbitrator can never answer the logically prior question what is the scope of the arbitration agreement? He stated that the arbitration agreement defines the scope of the disputes which fall within its terms, 
not the nature of the entitlement which a party may turn out to have established at the conclusion of the arbitral process. By defining the inquiry by remedy rather than subject matter, the Court of Appeal of Northern Ireland had ensured the dispute before them, whatever its nature, would be bound to fall outside the scope of the arbitration agreement. The BVI judge said the right question was whether the claim to wind up is a dispute arising out of or in connection with the articles, and that it was obvious that it is. The parties are bound together contractually by the articles. The claimants wish them to be unbound. The defendants disagree. This is a dispute in connection with the articles, he said. He went on, all arbitration agreements, by their nature, give up rights to approach the court. The fact that a right may be conferred by statute does not by itself mean that it may not be relinquished in favour of arbitration. He allowed the application for a stay and distinguished the position in respect of partnerships from that of an insolvent company, saying the long-standing objection to arbitrators purporting to wind up limited companies is not based only on the inability of a private individual to dissolve an entity which is entirely the creature of statute. It is based at least as firmly on the inability of a private individual acting as an arbitrator to make awards finding persons other than the parties to the arbitration. Dissolving a partnership, like a member's voluntary winding up, leaves the rights of creditors and others unaffected. They remain free to pursue liable partners singly or collectively. Considering these and other BVI cases, it seems clear then that at least in this jurisdiction, the court has not shown any desire, at least while court is in session, to compete with arbitrations. Rather than being any sort of rebuke, the wording of Section 3 of the Arbitration Act, which talks of the court interfering in arbitrations, actually seeks to put into clear statutory language the view which the BVI courts have already taken. Where possible, they will allow arbitration to take place without any impediment. So how does our court system in practice support arbitration? In the BVI, the new Arbitration Act is at pains to delimit precisely how the court will interact with an arbitration. The general approach is that the court's involvement or potential involvement should be clearly marked out and limited. If parties to an arbitration do have to approach the court, the other parties can be safe in the knowledge that that approach is itself part of the carefully worked out arbitration process rather than a departure from it. The court's role is largely to get an arbitration back on track to protect it from being undermined and to give limited oversight. Thus, for example, where a party has challenged the appointment of an arbitrator and that challenge has failed before the tribunal, the party has 30 days to request that the court decide the issue. The court's decision then can't be appealed. Similarly, where a tribunal has ruled as a preliminary question that it has jurisdiction, a party has 30 days from notice of that ruling to request that the court decide the matter. Again, there is no right of appeal. In these examples, the court is not an outsider to the arbitration process, but a necessary adjunct to it. It can provide assistance in taking evidence, can extend time to bring an arbitration if no tribunal has yet been brought into existence, and can assess costs if the parties agree to that. Where it does assess costs, there again is no right of appeal. One of the more important roles of the court that the court has under the Act is in granting interim measures in the usual course of events, where the arbitration has been commenced, one would expect the parties to make use of the tribunal's own powers to grant interim measures, although they can agree to exclude those powers. If they don't exclude them, these powers allow the tribunal to order a party to one, maintain or restore the status quo pending determination of the dispute, two, take action that would prevent or refrain from taking action that is likely to cause current or imminent harm or prejudice to the arbitral process itself, Three, provide a means of preserving assets out of which a subsequent award may be satisfied. Or four, preserve evidence that may be relevant and material to the resolution of the dispute. However, Article 9 of the Unser Trial Model Law, which I think we've just looked at, uh, which has been incorporated, provides it is not incompatible with an arbitration agreement for a party to request, before or during arbitral proceedings, from a court an interim measure of protection and for a court to grant such measure. Further, by Section 43 of the Act, the Court is given the same suite of powers, including by way of injunction, in relation to any arbitral proceedings which have been or are to be commenced in or outside the BVI. Notably, there is no suggestion that Court's powers can be excluded by agreement, and this shows that the Court's ability to provide relief is regarded as essential. 
Where the tribunal has not yet been composed, it will naturally fall to the court to grant any necessary interim measures. But even where the tribunal is in place, a party can still request the court to make use of these powers. However, the court can then decline to grant relief if the interim measure sought is the subject of arbitral proceedings and the court considers it more appropriate for the interim measure to be dealt with by the tribunal. Presumably, one reason why the court might grant an interim measure, even in those circumstances, would be in a case of extreme urgency. Another reason why the court might anyway not consider it more appropriate for the interim measure to be dealt with by the tribunal may be if it cuts across the rights of non-parties to the arbitration. The tribunal clearly doesn't have the power to make any order against a non-party. So, for example, it could not grant any effective equivalent to a freezing order, as it would not affect the banks where assets are held, since they are strangers to the arbitration. Similarly, since an arbitration clause is a private agreement, the arbitrators have no real power to order sanctions where there has been a breach of an interim measure, but not threaten contempt or sequestration of assets, for instance. The court is also given the power to make interim measures in respect of arbitral proceedings, which have been or are to be commenced outside the BBI, but only if those proceedings are capable of giving rise to an award capable of being enforced here, and the interim measure sought belongs to a type or description that may be granted in the BVI by the court in relation to arbitral proceedings. The court also has the power to make incidental orders and directions to ensure the effectiveness of any interim measure. One danger which comes out of the Arbitration Act's clear desire to delimit the precise role of the court is that it might be argued that it forms a complete code. That becomes a danger where it can be argued that some of the assistance which the court might usually offer arbitrations is not covered by the Act. In England, somewhat similar phrases to those in our Act led to it being argued that the court had lost its power to grant anti-suit injunctions to protect a client's agreement to arbitrate in circumstances where an arbitration was neither underway nor yet intended. Clearly, an anti-suit injunction protecting the right to have disputes resolved by arbitration could not be said to fall foul of Section 3's edict that the court not interfere in the arbitration of a dispute. On the contrary, an anti-suit injunction protecting the right to arbitrate would be entirely in line with the principles of the Act. In Ust Kamenogorsk Hydra Power Plant, the Supreme Court considered this question of whether the English Act could be said to form a complete code, such that any of the Court's former powers which were not included in it should be taken to have been removed. Lord Mance's view was that it would be astonishing if Parliament should silently and without warning have abrogated or precluded the use by the English Court of its previous well-established jurisdiction in respect of foreign proceedings commenced or threatened in breach of the negative aspect of an arbitration agreement. It seems likely that a similar approach will be taken in the BBI if it is argued that the new Act has led to the removal of any of the Court's important established powers for protecting arbitration agreements. The Court will not let its powers be eroded except by the clearest statutory language. I'm slightly worried to look at you there because I know you're on the leading side. <laughs> yes. <laughs> A vital case, anyway. <laughs> where the court really becomes the key player is when it comes to the actual enforcement of an arbitral award. By Section 81 of the Act, an arbitral award, wherever it was made, is by leave of the court, enforceable in the same manner as a judgment or order of the court that has the same effect. Sensibly, leave of the court is then required for any appeal from a decision to grant or refuse leave to enforce an award. Enforcement is obviously the final stage of the dispute resolution process. And so all too often, a losing party might be tempted to appeal just to delay the inevitable. The requirement for leave will at least filter out hopeless appeals. A distinction is then drawn between New York Convention awards and non-convention awards. The Act tidies up an anomaly in the previous BVI Arbitration Act, which had excluded UK awards. Those are now treated as any other convention award. The main distinction here between convention and non-convention awards is that for a convention award, enforcement can only be refused where the person against whom it is invoked proves a convention defence. Non-convention awards can be refused enforcement on the same grounds, but also for any other reason the court considers it just to do so. Broadly, these convention defences do not allow the enforcement court any function in deciding whether or not the award is correct as a matter of fact and law. The enforcement court's function is mainly just to decide whether there's been a fair hearing under a valid arbitration agreement, leading to a binding award which does not contravene the laws of the Virgin Islands or public policy. The court does have some discretion in deciding whether to allow enforcement of the convention award, 
And the remit of that discretion has been a matter of debate in the BVI as elsewhere. In Pacific China and Grand Pacific, the Eastern Caribbean Court of Appeal overturned a decision on whether a convention award could found a winding up petition. Mr. Justice Bannister said that it could, notwithstanding that the respondent company had raised arguments, that it was unable to present its case, that the arbitral process was not in accordance with the party's agreement, and that accordingly any enforcement would also be against public policy. The court below found that it could not dismiss the grounds raised as being incapable of being developed, but then went on to consider whether the procedural irregularities complained of actually impacted the outcome of the arbitration. Finding that they did not, the court allowed the application to appoint liquidators. The Court of Appeal gave careful consideration to the precise ambit of the court's discretion in deciding whether to refuse enforcement of the Convention Award. Two conflicting common law lines of authority, one English and one Far Eastern, were considered, and the court decided to follow the English decision. Ultimately, the Court of Appeal decided that the discretion is a narrow one, in which a court is justified in overriding a convention defence where there has been waiver or circumstances giving rise to an estoppel, or where the error is minor and prejudicially irrelevant. It does not permit the enforcing court to undertake a merits review of the award and to import into the exercise of the discretion the consideration as to whether, had the irregularity not occurred, the outcome would have been unaffected. Although Pacific China was decided under the old Act, there is nothing in the new Act to cast any doubt on it, and it remains good law. It is essential where parties have entered into an agreement as to how their disputes are to be resolved, and have given up their right to litigate that, that the process they have agreed is the process they get. In an international arbitration, unless they have specifically agreed to opt in, as we've seen, there can be no appeal from the award. So procedural fairness is even more important than it would be normally in litigation. Mr. Justice Bannister had cause to consider the proper approach to a challenge to the enforceability of a non-convention award in Vendort and Everestroy. There, the applicant sought to set aside a statutory demand, which was based on an arbitration award. It was said that since the award had been rendered, it had become clear from evidence given in Russian criminal proceedings that the testimony given in the arbitration had been false. Further, it was submitted that the award had been procured by fraud. The court did not accept that there was sufficient material before it to establish fraud and said even if it was accepted that the witness had lied to the arbitrator, I cannot see how that would mean that the award was arguably tainted by procedural irregularity or based upon a fundamental mistake, nor why that means that it would be contrary to the public policy of the Virgin Islands to recognise the award. A foreign arbitral award is recognised or enforced not because the domestic court believes it to have been correctly decided, but because it represents the best bargain between the parties. They agreed to be bound by the decision of the arbitrator. They did not agree to be bound by process out with that bargain, which is why challenges to arbitral awards are challenges to the process rather than challenges on the merits. But no complaint is made about the process. This element of the complaint is that if the case was re-argued, the result might be different. That is not, as I understand it, a ground why this court should not recognise the award. The Court of Appeal upheld that decision, under the old Act, there wasn't any real guidance as to the circumstances in which the court might decline to enforce a non-convention award. But the new Act's importation of convention defences, which are largely aimed at process, would appear to suggest this decision would be followed under the new Act. That said, the additional ground that the court can now decline to enforce a non-convention award where for any other reason it is just to do so, does leave some room for doubt. Those words would appear to import a wider perhaps a much wider discretion into the court's determination whether to enforce. It remains to be seen whether this will lead to significant developments in the court's approach to enforcing non-convention awards in the BBI. My prediction is that it probably actually won't, as it is unlikely that the court will want to take a significantly different approach to non-convention awards in circumstances where the new Act has for the most part set out that the same defences should apply. But the answers to these and any other questions arising from the new Act will no doubt be answered by the Court in its decisions over the next few years. Finally, this is yet another important role for the Court, because unlike arbitrations, Court judgments create precedents which ultimately provide certainty. Thank you very much.